so great that you're all joining us tonight. We have a full house. In fact, we added, we had to actually pay to add more people to this lecture. So thank you to everyone who made a contribution when you registered because that really helped to offset some of the costs of adding more people to, the, to listen to this lecture. So we really appreciate your support right now. Um, everything is closed at the museum. Um, for the foreseeable future, but we know that the museum will be opening again um, in the spring. So we're, we're excited. We have a lot going on at the Historical Society, as you probably have heard, the Oppenheimer House. We are right now, even though the museum is closed, we are working on getting that house um, open to the public. It's going to take some work, but we are committed to doing that, so we're working really hard to make sure that happens. Welcome to tonight's lecture. My name is Liz Martino. I'm the executive director of the Los Alamos Historical Society, and we welcome you tonight. We especially appreciate the support of Enterprise Bank and Trust and Robin and Richard McLean, who helped to sponsor this lecture series, and also the New Mexico Humanities Council. We have some lectures coming up in the spring. Those will also be virtual by Zoom. And, but I think the topics are really interesting, so I think you'll enjoy them. In February, we will have a lecture about spinning off from the Manhattan Project and the origin of Sandia National Laboratory. In March, we will have a lecture by Sean Levy about prohibition. This has been requested by multiple people to have Sean uh, give this lecture. So uh, I think that's going to be a really fun one in March. And then in April, we'll have the history of Los Alamos from a different point of view from the uh, San Ildefonso Pueblo. So that should be an interesting one too. And we hope that you'll join us for our spring lectures. If you need more information, you can look on our website for all the up for upcoming lectures and also, it just has information about the Oppenheimer House. If you're interested in donating to help get that open to the public, there's a link there where you can make a donation and it's, it's going to take some work to get that open. So we appreciate any support you can give us in that endeavor. So tonight, let me find my, if I can find, ah, here we go, oops. Tonight, we are welcoming Alex Wellerstein. He's a historian of nuclear weapons and his first book, Restricted Data, the History of Nuclear Secrecy in the United States is being published by the University of Chicago Press early next year. He's an assistant professor and the director of science and technology studies at the Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey. He received his PhD in history of science from Harvard University in 2010. And tonight we welcome Alex to this virtual lecture and I'm hoping that someday we'll, have, we'll welcome him in person. Uh, maybe a tour of the Oppenheimer house will be in order by then. So um, welcome, Alex. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, I'm gonna share my screen in a second, but I also wanna thank all of you for signing on. Some of you who have your video on, I, I know some of you and it's good to see you and I recognize some of the names. Um, it would be better to do this in person, but we probably wouldn't have as many people. So, you know, give and take. I'm going to be sharing my screen, which means I won't be able to see your cameras while my screen is sharing. So I'm just letting you know that. Uh, so if you want to make faces at me, you're welcome to, but I won't be able to react. Uh, so first I'm going to share and you're going to see my dog for a second and then you'll see my, my slides. So first here is the dog. And... Uh, here are my slides, and you should be able to see that. So I'm assuming you will. All right, welcome. I'm uh, Alex Wellerstein. As, as they said, I'm a historian of uh, science and a historian of nuclear weapons. Um, this talk is about the secrecy in the Manhattan Project. Now, the story of the Manhattan Project and its all pervasive secrecy is pretty well known. It's one of the major facets of the Manhattan Project, and any story about the Manhattan Project has to emphasize this. Um, but what I'm interested in doing in this talk, and this comes out of 
uh, work on my book, which I'll plug in just a second, um, is looking very carefully at what the Manhattan Project secrecy was designed to do and trying to figure out, sort of go through and almost give it a report card on whether it did what it was intending to do or whether it didn't and how it actually worked at a sort of uh, micro level. Because it's one thing to say they kept it very secret, but it's another thing to translate that goal into actual reality. And that's what I'm extremely interested in as a historian um, because uh, the secrecy that goes went into place with the Manhattan Project didn't go away. Um, it is a really interesting moment in that you have a period of relatively low secrecy, especially in science, prior to World War II and the Manhattan Project. And then afterwards, you have a period of very high secrecy, uh, especially in science thereafter. And this raises a lot of tricky sort of practical and uh, sort of political problems in the American context, because the United States uh, is not actually as compatible with secrecy as it might appear. Um, we are used to secrecy at this point, and we have quite a lot of it. But um, when you compare the United States to, say, Soviet Russia, for example, uh, there, there's, there are real uh, barriers to successful secrecy in the United States, things like freedom of the press, freedom of expression. Um, and so in this talk, I'm going to be looking specifically at the Manhattan Project, specifically at how you translate this goal of secrecy into a reality. I'm not going to be covering every aspect of nuclear secrecy before the Manhattan Project. So Leo Zillard's self-censorship isn't really going to come into this. Um, and I'm also not going to cover even some of the very um, uh, almost end of the Manhattan Project, things like what they do after the bombing of Hiroshima. That would just be too long of a talk. That's, that would be other chapters of my book. And my book, as we, we, you were, by the way, speaking of secrets, you were the first people to see the finalized cover. So I'm letting you in on the secret. We just got this finalized today. Um, but it will be out in early 2021, Restricted Data, The History of Nuclear Secrecy in the United States. It goes from basically the 1930s to the present and looking at secrecy and nuclear weapons. So this talk is basically a chapter in the book. Um, if you have questions about these things, feel free to ask them in the q and I'd be more than happy to, um, to uh, uh, address them. I'm, I'm happy to talk about stuff other than the Manhattan Project in the Q&A. All right. I will say, I will say um, if you have a question, there's a chat box. If you look kind of down at the bottom, that's where you can type in your question and then we will read them to him at the end of the talk or, yeah. So just that's where it is <laughs> if you're new to Zoom. <laughs> I'm unfortunately not new to Zoom. I use it multiple times a day. I'm sure there's others in here who are in the same boat. I wish I was new to Zoom again. Um, the Manhattan Project was secret. This is not just a statement of the history. This is what it wanted people to know after the war ended. Um, the fact of it being a secret was one of the great exciting things about the Manhattan Project. And, and actually the idea of them having kept a great secret was actually um, something that the Manhattan Project themselves put out as part of their post Hiroshima campaign uh, to sort of make the Manhattan Project look interesting and good and special in the eyes of everybody else. And I just always have thought that that was an interesting thing. It's not just that it was secret, it's that they purposely developed a narrative about how secret they were, were and how good they were um, and how effective they were as a form of propaganda. And that doesn't mean that it was wrong, but it is interesting. This is sort of government developed story about itself is partially how great of a secret what it was. And this includes this phrase, which I use in the title, um, that the atomic bomb was the, quote, best kept secret of the war. Um, that phrase uh, originated just after the Hiroshima bombing, um, and it was sort of a self-congratulatory uh, uh, application. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was one of the successes of the project that was being held up was all of this secret uh, secrecy. And they had a whole branch, which I'm really not going to talk about in this talk, unfortunately, though that would be like the next chapter of public relations and a whole lot of orientation towards sort of managing public understanding of the Manhattan Project and managing understanding of its secrecy, uh, not just because they wanted to look good, but because they wanted to maintain that secrecy uh, that happened. Um, and so part of the story about how secret it was, was about emphasizing how important their secrecy was and how it needed to continue. Um, Another part was to sort of give a nod and give credit to the many people who worked on the project in the hopes that they might 
maintain that secrecy and feel like they were being appreciated, uh, even though they were uh, often uh, uh, unaware that they were complicit in, in building these the, the weapons. Um, and so this this is again, uh, uh, I just put this in here to emphasize they, they have an entire uh, area of public relations. Um, and they were especially interested in making sure that everybody, especially who helped keep the secret, was given credit for that. What is the Manhattan Project? I assume most people on this talk have an idea of this, uh, and we're on more or less the same page about this, but I want to draw your attention to some of the underlying structural uh, issues that influence their secrecy. Um, the first is that the Manhattan Project was sort of the third iteration of uh, an American fish and research. First is the Uranium Committee, which was founded uh, after Einstein's letter to Roosevelt. The second was what's called the S1 Committee, which started in 1941 when they, when Vannevar Bush sort of uh, reorganized the entire thing. And then finally, the Manhattan Project itself, which was when the army was brought in with the goal of making a weapon uh, to use in the war. So um, the Manhattan Project, qua Manhattan Project, is not that whole thing. That whole thing is sort of those previous two uh, efforts are research to figuring out whether you can and should make a bomb. The Manhattan Project is the effort to actually make a bomb. Um, the difficulty with the secrecy is that all of the sort of basic knowledge, it was uh, basic science behind the bomb um, was public information. So there were already a flurry of articles as early as 1939, but even continuing up through uh, 1941 or so uh, on the fact that you can split atoms, on the fact that this releases energy, on the fact that you could make a chain reaction. And this is one of the things that vexed people on the project, especially the scientists, but, but even the military. Um, how do you keep secret something that is essentially based on scientific information that's already been published? How do you keep this from sort of uh, bursting out at any given time? Um, the other thing I want to draw your attention to is how big the project was. Now, we all know the project was pretty large. We, it's, it's sort of famous for how large. But I, I, in my experience, I, people even then underestimate how large it was. This is the kind of map you often find. This is, I think, on the Department of Energy's website. And it sort of says, well, there's a few sites in this Manhattan project, of course, Hanford, where they made the plutonium, and Oak Ridge, where they made the enriched uranium, and Met, the Met Lab, they did research. Um, and then there's Los Alamos, which is both a lab and a town. Um, this map is on Wikipedia and is, is based on a map that Kenneth Nichols published in his book. Um, and it does a little better. It show, starts to show you some of the other sites. It's not just four sites. There were uh, other universities involved, like Berkeley. Um, there were other facilities, other laboratories uh, doing all manner of different things. Maybe it's uh, at Project Ames, they are turning, uh, figuring out how to make metallic uranium. Um, uh, some of the sites on there are heavy water production facilities. Uh, Inyo Kern is, is, is a high explosives uh, casting facility, things like that. Um, even this understates it quite a bit. Um, this is my own sort of part, part of a project I've been doing for a while now, which is about um, trying to index every site of the Manhattan Project and all of where the work was. And I'm only giving you a very small sampling here just to illustrate my point. But there were, you know, several big universities involved, Chicago, Berkeley, and Columbia are usually cited. Um, but there was also research taking place at many, 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 many e educational institutions in the United States. Um, not quite every institution or every major institution, because the Stevens Institute of Technology is not on here, but uh, many, many institutions across the United States. So I've just colored those orange for educational institutions. Um, you sometimes in those other maps will see a few companies listed, DuPont, Stone and Webster, some uranium mining companies, things like that. Um, but the amount of private industry involved was massive. Um, hundreds and hundreds of places contributed um, materials or research or um, pieces of the sort of total puzzle. Not all of them, in fact, very few of them knew exactly what their work was going towards, um, but they were uh, many and across the country. And in fact, that cluster in the Northeast, which is uh, you know, practically the whole Washington to Boston corridor, that's of course why it was called the Manhattan Project. The initial, um, the initial offices for the project were based in Manhattan, in New York, off Broadway. Um, because that was where you would be able to rendezvous with the industrial leaders who ran 
you know, this country's industry in the 1940s. Um, and then there are these government sites, which are sort of built out of nothing, right? Some of them are, some of them are like the Department of War. Okay, that's a real site. But, um, and again, the original headquarters in Manhattan Engineer District, but Oak Ridge and Los Alamos and Hanford and the Trinity site. These are, we, we associate some of these with the secret cities and things like this. If we go over all the government sites involved, it's quite a huge, uh, large list as well. Um, some of which are very, you know, not surprising, and some of which are surprising, like the fact that at Hanford, they use prison labor for some of the work they were doing up there. And so that they are, they, the, the federal prison industries had a, uh, had a contract with the government for things related to the Manhattan Project. Um, and if you put all these on the map, you get quite a large sort of subsection of the country that's involved with this. And I, uh, and again, this is only a sub, even this map is not really showing all of them. You can actually see my favorite site just at the very bottom there. It's cut off a little bit, but um, there was even a Manhattan Project site on the island of Cuba. Um, there was an air base that the, they would practice flying to on their planes that had been adapted for dropping the atomic bomb to sort of approximate the distance to Japan from, from Tinian. Um, there's a quote that Niels Bohr, the famous quantum physicist, uh, is said to have said when he came to the United States in 1944, and he had in 1939 said that it was unlikely that anybody was going to be able to make an atomic bomb, and he came to the United States and they showed him what they were doing, and he said, I told you it couldn't be done without turning the, the whole country into a factory, you have done just that. So geographically, it's very large. Um, each of these sites, of course, has people working on them. Each of these sites is in some degree of connection with its uh, outside community. Uh, they are not isolated. Even the ones that are relatively isolated, lots, like Los Alamos, is in connection with Santa Fe. Um, and certainly ones like Columbia are, or, or Berkeley or Ch University of Chicago are, are in very dense urban areas. Um, and so that's already a difficulty with secrecy. But the number of people working on the Manhattan Project is massive. Um, you've probably seen figures like 125,000 people worked on the Manhattan Project, and that's not actually correct. Um, it's, uh, this is a, uh, uh, from the Manhattan Project's internal sort of files of how many people were employed at any given time. You'll see that it maxes out at 125,000. That was its peak. Um, but it turned out there were many more people working on it than that because uh, the people who took those jobs didn't always stay in them. Um, in fact, many of the jobs were at Oak Ridge and Hanford, which had notoriously bad working conditions. And the people were not told why they were doing their jobs and how important they were really. And so many of them said, I don't wanna do this anymore and quit. And so some of these sites had as high as 20% turnover every month. So people 20% would quit and then they would be rehiring that 20%. And then on top of that hiring, whatever else they needed to make that curve go up. Um, so if you actually add up everybody who worked on the project at some time before quitting or moving to a different job, it actually comes up to 600,000 employees. So considerably more than the 125,000. And to just put that into to, um, to context, that's one out of every 250 Americans alive at the time, and it's about 1% of the civilian labor force. So if you were not too old or too young to work and you had not been drafted, uh, there was about a one in 100 chance that you worked on the Manhattan Project in some form, though you may not have known it, which is one of the really interesting aspects that we will get into. Um, and in terms of expense, it cost $2 billion, which uh, in 1945 money, um, that's about 1% of the cost of World War II um, and uh, which was the costliest war in U.S. history. Um, and other aspects of just the size, by, by late 1943, about 50% of all army construction was given to the Manhattan Project. Well over half of all carbon steel in the army was going to the Manhattan Project in 1943. Um, and I just emphasize all this, not just to make you impressed with how big it is, but impressed that they kept it relatively secret. Um, you know, Ben Franklin famously observed that three can keep a secret if two of them are dead. Secrecy doesn't scale well. It's very hard to have a giant conspiracy of hundreds of thousands of people um, and not have it leak out. So you have a project here with hundreds of thousands of people spread around the country, moving around. They're not wed to the project once they take the job. They can quit. And there were some people who quit Los Alamos, including scientists. Um, and the thing is essentially based on public scientific work, how do you keep it secret? This is the puzzle. This is the, the, the sort of impossible job that they have. 
Uh, the only thing, by the way, that makes it slightly possible is they are not trying to keep it indefinitely secret. They are only trying to keep it secret for about two and a half years. And that puts a much stronger uh, limit on what the difficulty is than if they were trying to keep it secret for decades and decades. So how do you keep things secret? Um, the desire to keep things secret is an idea. It isn't the thing itself. To, to actually make something secret, you have to translate that idea into a reality. You have to, we could say, reify it. And you do that through, and this is as much fancy jargon as I'm gonna use in this talk, you use this, do this through practices. You do it through activities, we could say. Um, secrecy is a practice in which you are trying to limit information or limit the number of people it is uh, accessible to. Um, the word secrecy uh, comes from the Latin word for cutting. You are cutting information out of the world. You are cutting people out of the world. You're sort of dividing the world into those who know and those who do not. Um, and the stamp, the secrecy stamp is perhaps the most totemic aspect of this. And we associate secrecy with a big red secret stamp on something. Um, but uh, it, it's not just about it looking impressive, it, it serves a real function. It's document identification. It lets somebody who is using this document know exactly what level of attentiveness they have to give to its uh, security. It also corresponds with a sort of broader system that we'll get into a second of regulations on what you can do with this document. And it also tells you at the end of the day whether you can leave the document on the table or not. And it's a very practical sort of thing to have these stamps. And one of my favorite, by the way, documents I came across during my research was somebody at one of these faraway sites who did not have a stamp. And so he had to write secret on every page. And by the end, he writes plaintively in all capital letters, we need a stamp, um, and they got him a stamp. But if you don't have the stamp, it's a real problem. Um, this is another form of these practices. Uh, th this is a document cover sheet. So for the most secret documents, and by the way, the top secret classification level was only created during the war. And it was meant to only be for things like D-Day, sort of like, major turning points that could be a big problem. But General Groves, who we'll talk about in a second, he appropriated it for the Manhattan Project as well, which initially got some pushback even from people like Oppenheimer, but eventually they sort of accepted it. Um, this sort of this piece of paper tells you immediately who can look at this document even before they've seen the document itself, but it also keeps track of who has looked at it. So uh, General Groves, you can see in this one, read this document on the 4th of July, 1945, or checked it out on the 4th of July. Um, and by keeping track of who had the document, you could in theory enforce a kind of uh, control over it if it somehow got you know misplaced. This is by the way, one of my favorite uh, artifacts, and I actually have this in my book, these top secret document cards, they all look like this. This is like a hand-drawn thing. It reminds me of like a, of like a teenager's notebook. Um, top secret, and then they, they must have mimeographed it, and they used it for every single top secret document. And I just love the informality of it. It does not look bureaucratized yet. They're, they're getting there. But this is how new the secrecy is. They don't actually have a category called top secret, and they don't have identification sheets. They're literally making these things by hand um, uh, and sort of figuring things out as they go. Another totemic form of secrecy that we associated is, of course, the badge, the security badge. These are Groves and Oppenheimers. I love that, by the way, on Groves is they misspelled his name. I mean, the guy really can't get respect. He's running the whole project and they write Grover on his badge and somebody has to go in there with a pen and put Groves. It's very embarrassing. Um, the point of a badge is to uh, do two things. One is for your basic identification, right? They know who you are as you go through the door and they can look at it and say, okay, badge K6 came in, that's Oppenheimer. And the other is to indicate that you're, you've been investigated, you've been cleared. You have, they have looked into your background. They have a said, yes, indeed, you may come in. And at Los Alamos during the war, they had different colors of badges that indicated where you could go within the laboratory and how much you were allowed to know. Um, but they, they're sort of a, uh, uh, their identification of who can touch these documents that you have deemed secrecy. So this is again, deemed secret. So this is how you divide up the people. Um, and of course, before you can get to the stage, you have to investigate them. 
Um, this is the uh, DC Armory, uh, which is a mixed use stadium in Washington, DC. Today, I think they use it mostly for hockey games. Um, but during World War II, the FBI took it over and turned it into uh, a storage for its index cards. They had so many background investigations during World War II that they could not use their normal facilities and they needed a giant overflow facility. So what you're seeing here is essentially a sports stadium that has been totally filled up with filing cabinets. And this is just giving you an indication of how much labor is involved in background investigations. They do not uh, happen on their own. They require an immense infrastructure to put in place. You need the background investigations to determine who is going to be inside your secret uh, circle that you're building and who is allowed to know the information, things like that. Um, so you can think of secrecy as dividing up people, it divides up knowledge, it also divides up spaces. So Los Alamos is, of course, the most prominent example of this, of a, of a, of a specially created space intended uh, for its secrecy. Uh, initially, the work for the Manhattan Project had been taking place at major universities, uh, Columbia, Chicago, Berkeley. Uh, it turns out that neither New York City, Chicago, or Berkeley are uh, especially secure locations. <laughs> and so uh, fairly early on, once the job of actually starting up the project was beginning, um, the idea occurred to several people uh, that they ought to pick an isolated site and put all of the really important work over there. Um, I find it very interesting as an aside that the first person who really got behind this idea that I found is uh, James Conant, uh, the president of Harvard. He's a chemist. He was a good colleague of Vannevar Bush's. He was, is one of the few people on the Manhattan Project who had actually worked in a secret site before. He, uh, during World War I, ran a secret facility outside of Cleveland to develop an arsenic-based gas that never got used in the war. Um, and it was notorious for its secrecy as well. And I just find that an interesting continuity that the one person who had run a secret site is the one who says, you know what, we need a secret site in an isolated location. Uh, people are sort of working with what they uh, know about. Um, at, at Los Alamos, you not only had uh, you know, a checkpoint for deciding who could go into the town and then who could go into the laboratory and then who could go into the technical area. You had this sort of literally, it was almost like a Venn diagram of uh, secret spaces uh, getting further and closer and closer to the secret stuff. Um, uh, this dividing up of physical spaces is a practice of secrecy as well. Um, and then you can even have sort of even more abstract approaches. The, the most famous policy of the Manhattan Project and the one that is perhaps most responsible for all of those hundreds of thousands of people basically not leaking everything out is Groves' uh, policy of compartmentalization. So uh, this is the need to know idea. Uh, this is the idea that you only should be told the minimum amount you need to do your job or as Groves put it, compartmentalization of knowledge to me was the very heart of security. My rule is simple and not capable of misinterpretation. Each man or woman uh, should know everything he needed to know to do his job and nothing else. Uh, this is sort of secrecy within secrecy. So uh, you could be in the secret system, but not be allowed to know certain things that were judged to be uh, uh, you know, not, not something you needed to know to do your job. This is a common counterintelligence practice. It wasn't invented by Groves, but Groves took it to extremes that were considered extreme even by other members of the sort of military uh, intelligence community at the time. Um, it had never been applied to something on this scale before where um, hundreds of thousands of people were working on something that they did not know what they were trying to accomplish. That's unusual. That's in part helped by the fact that uh, the idea of the atomic bomb was, while not secret, not exceptionally well known. I mean, if they had all been working on tanks, it would have been obvious they were working on tanks. Um, uh, this had all sorts of side effects, many of which were negative, famously so. Um, some of which uh, is expressed right after the war uh, ended by people saying, oh my God, I had no idea what I was doing. One of my favorite examples is from Oak Ridge. There was a woman whose job it was uh, when she did the laundry, she would wash workers' clothes and she would then, her job was to hold the clothes up to a machine. And if the machine beeped, you put the machine back in the laundry again. And if it didn't beep, it was ready to go back. And she had no idea what the machine was or what was going on. Of course, most people listening to this will say that sounds like a Geiger counter. She's measuring how much contamination there is. Um, but she wasn't told that. And it's it's hard to know in, in some of these cases whether things like compartmentalization 
you know, they, they almost certainly added to the difficulties of health safety and things like this. Um, there's also a lot of uh, sort of jokes that get told about compartmentalization afterwards. The scientists complain bitterly about it. This is the aspect of secrecy that they find most unlike what they're used to. They're used to being able to talk to whoever they want, whenever they want, and know the full picture. And they felt uh, essentially hampered by the lack of uh, ability to sort of ask anything they wanted. One of my favorite sort of jokes about this is from Henry DeWolf Smythe, who's a major physicist who uh, uh, worked on the project and also wrote the first history of the Manhattan Project, that he at one point had two jobs. And uh, because he was in those jobs and they were not actually connected to each other, he would quip that he was not allowed to talk to himself. Um, this is the kind of compartmentalization story you get. Some of them are much more bitter. There's actually lots of, there's sort of a genre of how I broke compartmentalization during the Manhattan Project stories that became very popular when scientists would complain because they weren't getting access to what they wanted. And so they might, you know, pick the safe or they might go talk to the guy anyway, or they might, you know, find some way around this. One interesting thing about compartmentalization is, uh, as we'll see in a second, Groves didn't just see it as a way to uh, keep people from knowing too many secrets. He also saw it as a way to control scientists, which is an interesting uh, uh, additional benefit from his point of view. Um, practices in general can mean anything. They, they, any, it's anything you are doing in the world to make this real. Um, and they can include a lot of different things, in, including sometimes misinformation. So after the Trinity test, uh, there was false information put out deliberately about what the explosion was that, of course, the many communities around uh, the, the testing site uh, were aware of. Um, and they were not ready to reveal, of course, that it was an atomic bomb at that point, but uh, they put out a story on that it was an ammunition dump that had exploded. And uh, they were actually more cautious about misinformation than the sort of cloak and dagger approach might make you think. Um, they were really afraid that if you put out false information that people could spot as false, uh, that that would provoke more investigation. And so when they did use misinformation, which I count about three times in which they actually used misinformation during the Manhattan Project, they mostly tried to keep it in a very um, understated, not that interesting, um, only reserve it for things that were uh, at least plausibly deniable approach because they were more afraid of, of catching somebody's attention than they, uh, with misinformation than they almost were with the thing itself. You could imagine something going off and people not really looking into it for a couple of weeks. But if you put out a story that doesn't add up, now you've got people's attention. They also did some of these acts with practices that were um, sort of sociological in nature, that are about, or even psychological in nature, that are about inculcating the people on the project into this world, into these habits. And one of my favorites of these is uh, secrecy oaths, which are, you know, not very legally binding in any way. The ones they had on the project were not legally binding at all. Um, they are just the sort of totemic activity of making somebody sign their name, read a thing out loud that they agreed that this was, you know, they were supposed to keep a secret and that they understood it and that there might be bad things that happened if they didn't do it. And that, you know, this is uh, common in secrecy regimes, including non-weapons ones. I mean, this is common in fraternities. This is common in secret clubs of all sorts to have this sort of oath reading and, and, uh, uh, at best, they function a little like contracts, but I think it's mostly a psychological effect. It's about sort of scaring into compliance and sort of forcing somebody to reckon with them, what, what they're doing. This one I really like, the one I'm showing you on the screen here. This is the Declaration of Secrecy for the physicists, chemists, and other employees of a similar professional and scientific caliber, which is to say the scientists had their own secrecy oath. And the only sentence that differed is the last sentence of that first long paragraph. Upon the truth of this statement, I stake my personal and scientific reputation and I really just like that they thought, you know, what we ought to do with scientists is make them stake their scientific reputation. That will make them, no scientists, you know, you don't want them to swear on their mother. Definitely not a Bible, right? Like make them swear on their scientific reputation and then they won't violate. So we could list a bunch of them. Um, I'm just going to give you a sort of overview of, of, of what, I'm what I've sort of been talking about here. 
Um, we have document control, again, stamps, guidelines for what you do with the documents. What kind of safe do they go into, for example? Um, uh, are you allowed to transport them from site to site without a guy with a gun with you? This is what we would call document control. Uh, personal security investigations of, and clearances. So you're classifying people about how safe they are, how reliable they are. Um, physical security. These are things like fences, guards, safe. These are like ways of dividing up spaces and making sure that uh, people are not allowed to just sort of circulate with your other people or knowledge or what have you. Um, site isolation, taking these critical facilities and putting them places where they aren't embedded in a, in a big urban area with the goal of um, uh, <laughs> um, with, with the goal of uh, uh, making sure that that you don't have too much uh, possibility that you're not able to track people, for example, which doesn't totally work, but having people at Los Alamos, um, you can watch who comes and goes a lot easier than you can in like Columbia University, for example. Um, code names, so avoiding saying what you mean with the assumption that maybe some of your information will get lost and, uh, and you want to make it as hard as possible for anybody to understand it if they did see it. So, um, uh, they actually had really terrible code names initially, like very early on. They would call um, the, some of the metals they were interested in, like aluminum, uh, excuse me, like uranium, they would call it aluminum or plutonium, they might call copper. But then they occasionally had to talk about actual copper. And so then they would be talking about honest to God copper and honest to God aluminum. Those aren't good code names. Um, they eventually made better code names that were uh, both useful, but also uh, a little more obscured. Um, Indoctrination, this is sort of the effect of trying to get people to um, accept that they are, need to be security conscious, to change their day-to-day -day habits. Don't talk on the phone. Don't say and write important things in a, in a letter. Um, uh, always make sure you put everything away at the end of the day. Make sure the door is locked behind you. Report anybody you don't see, uh, things of that nature. Um, compartmentalization, this is the need to know principle again. This is uh, only telling people, uh, only letting people know what you think they need to know. Uh, censorship, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but um, there was censorship of project personnel. Mail was censored, for example, at Los Alamos. Um, they also had some uh, news media censorship, but it was all voluntary. We'll talk about that in a second, but there is no coercive media censorship in the United States, though what voluntary means can vary a little bit because sometimes they would you know, send the FBI to go harass you. and. And, and sort of threaten you and then you would, you know, probably do what they said, even if actually their legal grounds are pretty shaky, but it was technically a voluntary censorship system. Um, misinformation, planted rumors, occasional false denials, uh, occasional false information. Again, only about three of these that I know of uh, from World War II, um, including one at Los Alamos where uh, the scientists were instructed to go to a local bar in Santa Fe and claim, talk, get drunk and talk loudly and claim they were making electric rockets um, with the hope that that would throw anybody off the scent. And apparently nobody was interested whatsoever. Um, they did occasionally deny that there would be a report that said, oh, they're making atomic bombs or they're making heavy water. And they would say, we don't know any way to make heavy water into an atomic bomb, which is technically kind of true, but you know, things that are skirting plausibility. And of course, like things like the Trinity site. Um, they had their own counterintelligence branch, essentially in the Manhattan Project. Groves' sort of powers were extremely extensive. He basically had his own Army G2 detachment, so he could do a wide variety of activities that normally would not be totally under his control. Um, uh, so he could be constantly looking for spies or even just most or leaks within his mist or, or investigating rumors, things like that. They also used the FBI, even though the FBI was not technically sort of in on the secret, but they were, you know, good at investigating communists. They even had foreign intelligence with the Alsos mission where they sent these G2 uh, officers and some scientists into Europe as they conquered it to learn as much as possible about the German program. Um, and all of this was being run out of the Manhattan Project. Um, they had a black budget. Um, they did not report how much money they were taking for some of the project. They eventually, uh, uh, they mostly initially, the initial money was paid out of a special fund that Roosevelt could sort of hide from other people. When they got to enough money that you couldn't do that anymore, they did have to go through uh, Congress and appropriate it, but they basically were trying as much as possible to avoid anybody looking into what they were spending the money on. I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and any good secrecy regime needs actually uh, plausible punishment. 
And so uh, they did have some legal teeth. Uh, they had, what happens if you violate the secrecy? What happens to you? Um, in this case, their main law that they're relying on is the Espionage Act of 1917, which is a pretty harsh law. It's, it's vague enough that you can essentially execute somebody with it if you think they've been a spy. Um, uh, so that's that's a pretty hard, World War One era secrecy law. It's basically the United States' first major secrecy law. Um, they also could just intimidate people. So they could just, as I mentioned before, show up and tell somebody that bad things could happen to them if they continue to do what they were doing. Um, uh, but uh, even that that was mostly relying on the fact that, especially during World War II, you don't want these army guys showing up and threatening you. They didn't actually have that many means of shutting things down as occasionally became apparent when uh, things went wrong. Before we go further into the little ones I wanna talk about, I just wanna circle back from the how and talk a little bit about the why, uh, because the why can give us a good framework for evaluating how they succeeded. And what I mean specifically is why did they have so much secrecy? <laughs> I mean, it seems kind of obvious, okay, you don't want the Germans or something like this, but why go to all this effort? This is a lot of effort, and this is more secrecy than is being applied to basically any other American wartime project, certainly of that size. Um, why so much secrecy for this one thing? And the boring answer is that Roosevelt demanded it. Um, the order he gave to Vannevar Bush to accelerate the work and get the army involved and things like that to build the weapon, um, essentially says, and you can see it in the last sentence there, um, I have no objection, uh, excuse me, I have no objection to turning over future progress to the War Department on condition that you yourself are certain that the War Department has made all adequate provision for absolute secrecy. And this term absolute secrecy becomes a sort of watchword for what Roosevelt wants. And it gets used by Bush and then by Groves as a justification for all of this expansive secrecy. And they tell Roosevelt about this. He signs off on this. This is exactly what he wants. Why? Why does Roosevelt want this? He doesn't say this for radar. He doesn't say this for bombers. He, do he doesn't say this for any other wartime project. And it's hard to know for sure. And the reason it's hard to know for sure is FDR didn't tell anybody. <laughs> he didn't tell people why he did things. He rarely elaborated uh, on the kinds of instructions he gave. Um, he was sort of reflexively secret. Um, he was habitually secret in almost all of his doings, um, including amongst his own cabinet and things like that. He was a very crafty guy and he was a very clever guy. And he used secrecy as a sort of bureaucratic weapon uh, throughout his administration. Um, we can, of course, take some guesses, right? Um, uh, the Germans, the Japanese, uh, things like that, of course, right? That, that looms large. Um, it's actually a little tricky to say, well, because he understood the atomic bomb would be this world-shaking thing. The, the bombs he was thinking about in 1942 were not as actually as large as what they ended up being. So it's actually a little premature to make him that clairvoyant about these things. Um, as an aside, it's just a reminder that Roosevelt didn't tell Truman about this. Uh, he had told his previous vice president, Henry Wallace, he was actually involved with some of the policy on the Manhattan Project. Um, but when Truman became his vice president in uh, 1944, Roosevelt never let him in on the secret and Truman didn't find out about it until after Roosevelt's death, which is, that's the depth of secrecy that somebody like Roosevelt's gonna do. Why didn't Roosevelt let Truman in? We don't really know. He didn't tell anybody why he didn't let Truman in. We can assume he didn't want Truman in on it, but that is sort of a tautological answer. That's not really a very useful one. Um, a decade after the project was over, uh, Leslie Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project, the architect of much of its secrecy, um, wrote a letter to his son why, in uh, Richard Groves um, telling him why they did the secrecy. And this is the sort of clearest statement we have from anybody on their motivations. And we can also take this with a grain of salt. This is over a decade later. It suffers from some after the fact reasoning in places. It's post McCarthyism. So there's a lot of things that they learned by 1958 that they did not know when they were putting it in place. And it's, it's obviously reflects that a bit. But I actually think it's a fairly good framework to think about what they thought they were doing to one degree or another. Um, uh, the first is the sort of obvious answer to keep the knowledge from the Germans and to a lesser extent, the Japanese. Um, this is the sort of straightforward, why keep it secret? Fine. 
Um, the, the Germans are the major fear here that even uh, Groves in 1958 writes down. And that's because they feared, of course, that the Germans were making their own atomic bomb. And they believed very early on that they were in a very close race for the bomb with Germany. Um, they did not until 1944, late 1944, discover that this was not the case, that the German program had never really advanced past the research stage, and they were nowhere close to getting an atomic bomb. Um, for Japan, it's not so much that they feared they would get a bomb. They had no fears of Japan getting a bomb. Um, they were uh, mostly in terms of wanting to keep it a surprise, so it would have maximum psychological value. Um, were they successful at this? Largely, it seems so. Um, the Germans and the Japanese seem to have been thoroughly surprised by the whole thing. Um, we don't have great data on this, um, and it's hard to prove a negative, but uh, there was an incident which many watching here may know about uh, where the ALSOS team rounded up a number of prominent German nuclear physicists at the end of the war and took them to a, a manor house in England called Farm Hall and then basically bugged the place and listened to them talk and then uh, I told them about the news of Hiroshima and then saw the reactions, things like that. And at Farm Hall, um, it's pretty clear that the Germans uh, were not aware the Americans were anywhere close to getting an atomic bomb um, and were actually in denial about it when they first got the news of Hiroshima. They thought this cannot be true. They thought they, the Germans, were the pinnacle of nuclear physics in the world at the time. Um, uh, could they have been lying about this? Could they have been trying to fake out their, um, their handlers? You know, possibly, but we have some other information. One of my favorites is um, in February 1945, the FBI uh, caught German spies who landed on the U.S. coast. The Nazis at various point during the war tried to land German sort of spies and saboteurs, but they got caught basically immediately because it turns out that the Germans were not that good at foreign intelligence. Um, and they had some questions in their, uh, their list of questions about uh, uranium research. And this is the, what the questions were. Where is heavy water being produced? And what quantities? What method? Who are the users? Second, in what laboratories is work carried on with large quantities of uranium? Did accidents happen there? What does the protection against neutronic rays consist of in these laboratories? What is the material and strength of the coating? Third, is there anything known about the production of bodies or molecules of metal, metallic uranium rods, tubes, or plates? Are these bodies provided with coverings for protection? Of what do these coverings consist? These are the kinds of questions you would ask if you thought that they were running the same kind of program as the Germans. These are not questions that, that acknowledge that there is a massive 1% of the US civilian labor force working on the project size project going on. They're looking for little scientific details that might help them out a little bit. How do they deal with the accidents and, and, and safety? That is not the question you ask if you're actually trying to find out about a country who you think is making nuclear weapons, right? You'd wanna know where are they assembling the pit? How much plutonium are they making per month? When will they have the first bomb ready? I don't know, something like that, right? Um, these are the questions that indicate that the Abwar, the German foreign intelligence have no idea what the scale of the American project is. They assume that there is some kind of research going on. Um, but they don't know how big it is. And the assumption that it is small scale is not a crazy assumption because every other country in the world did small scale. Uh, but that's, uh, they, 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 it's just not within their area of contemplation. Um, with the Japanese, it's a lot harder to say what they knew. knew. I've seen nothing published on it. I don't read Japanese. Um, but the high command in Japan seemed pretty surprised and somewhat incredulous originally, even though they did know about the possibility of nuclear weapons. Um, that would be an area for future research. If any historians are here, I'd love to know what Japanese intelligence assessments were. I will say that the Japanese in 1941 had concluded when they were thinking about whether they should try their own atomic bomb program, they concluded that it wasn't doable and that not even the United States could do it in the time of the war. So again, it doesn't seem like they were expecting this to be a possibility at all. Um, here is the, the second one here, uh, and this is the one that's probably higher in priority in the 1950s than it was in the 1940s, but is Groves' is number two reason to keep it secret, to keep knowledge from the Russians. Um, uh, but he, this is clearly a big deal by the 1950s. Was it a big deal in the 1940s? I mean, to a degree, Groves was interested in, in keeping the Russians out of the research, and they did know that there was Soviet uh, uh, espionage attempts, uh, but the only ones they knew about were at Berkeley. So this is surrounding the students and friends of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Um, I won't get into all the details on this, but 
these were not actually, as far as we can tell, real espionage attempts, and none of the people who they ended up investigating were actually truly spies of any real sort. Um, but this is what they were, Groves was worried about during the war. And in fact, every time they gave an update to Roosevelt and Truman about the work they did, they would talk about the Russians are trying to get information, but we caught all of them and they haven't got any information and we've been very good at making sure they know nothing. Um, how did they do on actually keeping the knowledge from the Russians? Well, very poorly, we now know, right? Terribly. That turns out there were uh, Soviet spies, including uh, potentially four or five at Los Alamos, uh, but I want to listen to the big three here. Um, the first uh, Soviet bomb was a copy, and as much as you can copy a thing of the, the, the Nagasaki bomb. Um, there were several major spies, uh, again, at Los Alamos, but also at some other sites, um, on the order of maybe a dozen uh, spies throughout the entire project who were actually working on things, and this is including in the United Kingdom and Canada, uh, according to what we now know in the Venona transcripts and things like this. Um, and so in this sense, it's really clear that the Manhattan Project security in this particular sense was a failure. Uh, it did not, if, if one of the goals was keeping the Soviets from knowing about the atomic bomb, they completely failed. Stalin knew more about the atomic bomb than Harry Truman did before Harry Truman became president. Um, uh, we'll come back to this, but it's just worth putting that out there because that's obviously the elephant in the room. Uh, third way, uh, third reason, to keep as much knowledge as possible from all other nations. So it's not just the Germans and the Japans, the Soviets, it's everybody else, so that the US position after the war would be as strong as possible. Um, what are the other nations? Well, initially this included the British because Groves did not want the British to be involved with the Manhattan Project. He did not think that they needed any help from them. Um, he was uh, uh, not super favorable towards them. He sort of believed that they just really wanted to make money. That was his stereotype. And that the only reason they were getting involved in the Manhattan Project was because uh, they wanted to build industrial nuclear power immediately and become a great power in that sense. Um, uh, even when the British were allowed in the project, because Churchill charmed Roosevelt, essentially, um, Groves worked to really limit their knowledge as much as he could, even though they were supposed to get full access. So he allowed them to come to Los Alamos, and he allowed a couple to go to Oak Ridge, uh, but he did not let them near Hanford. He did not let them near whole areas of research uh, because he did not want them knowing, having too much of an advantage, and he did not think they were necessary. Um, but it's also not just them. He had real concerns with the French. Um, Frédéric Joliot Curie, a uh, major French nuclear physicist, was also a communist. And um, Joliot was in Paris during the war, but his collaborators had joined the British program. And uh, Groves basically made it so that they could only be work in Canada and that they could get essentially no American information. The Americans could get access to any research they did, but not vice versa, sort of one way compartmentalization. Um, and that's because he feared that after the war, they were going to go back to France and immediately give all their information to Joliot, a communist. Uh, another, another reason, uh, compartmentalization, as mentioned, uh, to keep members of the project working on their own tasks rather than thinking and working, uh, worrying about the tasks of others, which is an interesting way to frame it, right? This isn't about compartmentalization will limit the amount of knowledge any one spy could know or any one leak could have or anything like that. It's about managing the scientists, as I mentioned earlier. And he actually elaborated on this in length in the letter. As I've watched research and development since the war, this is much more important than I realized at the time I established it as a basic principle. I felt that if we did not compartmentalize, we would in effect be running an advanced postdoctorate university, which would have increased the personnel knowledge, personal knowledge of many scientific personnel, but would not have achieved the bomb. Um, he is uh, uh, extremely interested in uh, making sure these scientists, as he put it, uh, stick to their knitting. He wants, uh, uh, his, his idea of a scientist is not a very favorable one for the most part. He saw them as prima donnas. He saw them as people who, if you gave them, now that they had an unlocked amount of, you know, unlimited amount of research funds, would just try to like probe the mysteries of the cosmos and not build him the bomb they were supposed to. This is from his biography later, autobiography. Adherence to compartmentalization not only provided an adequate measure of security, but it greatly improved overall efficiency by making our people stick to their knitting. And it made quite clear to all concerned that the project existed to produce a specific end product, not to enable individuals to satisfy their curiosity and increase their scientific knowledge.
Um, he also was trying to manage specific scientists they did not trust. So those who say started worrying about the social implications of the bomb, uh, especially those at the University of Chicago, which became a sort of holding ground for problematic scientists. Um, the ones who he thought were reliably brought to Los Alamos. Uh, this includes Leo Zillard, uh, uh, who he actually drew up plans for having interned, inter being interned for the war uh, without habeas corpus uh, if Zillard would not uh, uh, go along with the secrecy. Um, and also the authors of the Franck Report, which uh, recommended not using the bomb and things like that. So compartmentalization was also meant to sort of keep scientists from sort of agitating and being part of the policy decisions in ways he didn't want them to. Um, and then this one is really interesting. Um, to keep knowledge from the hands of those who would interfere directly or indirectly with the progress of work, I felt it would be disastrous if every teacher or student of physics and chemistry could prevent, present his views to members of the Congress and require an answer to his ideas. Very little time had to be devoted by senior or even junior people to the answers of, answering of inquiries from offices either in the executive or legislative branches. You, you have to read between the lines a little bit here, but he's trying to keep the secret from um, elected representatives. Um, he's largely talking about Congress, but they had a major difficulty during the war um, that he sort of uh, that occupied a lot of his attention, more than this little paragraph uh, uh, lets on, with various members of the American government trying to audit what they were doing. Remember, they were not just keeping it secret from uh, all the people outside in the newspapers. They were keeping it secret from most of the military. They were keeping it secret from almost all of Congress. Um, and they were keeping it secret from organizations that were designed to make sure that spending was done judiciously. Um, this included uh, the most famously Harry Truman himself as a Senator. He was on a committee, the Truman Committee, uh, that was investigating uh, war spending and war fraud and things like that. And he heard about that there was all this money going into a site in Washington state called Hanford and nothing was coming out of it. And it, he actually several times it tried to investigate this and was told by the president and by the secretary of war to go away. And he said, okay, I will. And then he would come back a year later and say, I really need to find out. And it really uh, was a thorn in their side. Um, this may be why Roosevelt didn't want to tell him anything. Um, the fear of Congress actually predated the Manhattan Project. Uh, Vannevar Bush worried about it as early as 1941 because he was having tr trouble getting Congress to fund other scientific research. And he basically, as he said to the head of the National Sci uh, Academy of Sciences, this would be a thing, atomic bomb stuff, that could hardly be presented to a committee of Congress. Uh, you, you would not be able to explain the science fiction project to laymen uh, enough to justify the expense. And this is the kind of inquiries that they got, not even from Truman. This is from a, a representative, Albert Engel of Michigan, uh, in February 1945. It is difficult in my judgment to justify the expenditure of this tremendous sum of money for any purpose. It is certainly not good judgment for a committee to pass upon the appropriation with no justifications. They had to go back to Congress and ask for money. And so these committee members are saying, we need to know why you need billions of dollars. Um, uh, my information is that Dr. Conan of Harvard and other scientists sold the idea to the president that it involved the job of breaking down the atom. Um, and I, I was informed that, quote, a barrel of it would destroy Berlin and keep it burning for a year and other similar statements equally fantastic. Um, and, you know, he's very unhappy about this. And he actually has a, he, uh, uh, he actually tries to go to these plants and find out what they're doing in Oak Ridge. Um, and uh, he, he, he was refused to enter Oak Ridge. Uh, this is his line. I told him that it seemed rather strange to me while that he permitted 60,000 workers, male and female, blacks, yellow, whites, Mexicans, Chinamen, and Negroes, men of every race, creating color to go to these plants daily. I, a member of Congress and a member of the subcommittee responsible for handling these funds, was permitted not to see what was going on. This is the kind of problem they went. And Angle actually went on to um, uh, threaten to reveal these things in open, con in open uh, session. And uh, of course, the president had to get involved and tell him he better not do that. Um, he was not the only person to do this. Um, I'm just skipping a couple further examples. This is also from James Byrne, future Secretary of State. At the time, he was at the Office of, uh, War, uh, Office of War and Budget or something like that. Um, 
Uh, it would appear probable from these figures that more than one half of army military construction will file in the Manhattan category. I know the War Department may have some enterprise so important and so secret it might be unwilling to diverge the purpose and even details to the Office of War Mobilization. Um, uh, however, you and I should assure ourselves that these projects included under Manhattan are such a character that and that zealous officials do not use the convenience of high priorities and secrecy attached to Manhattan for the purposes of securing material for unrelated projects. This is the kind of thing they're afraid of. Um, and so in, interestingly, I actually suspect this is maybe one of the higher goals on the list. Groves lists it last, but um, from what they do during the project and the amount of effort they put into it, I think this is in, in many ways more on their mind than even the Russians are at that time. Why? Because the Soviets can't stop the Manhattan Project from succeeding, but Congress can. And they indicate this at various stages that they do not want this to get shut down. The number one goal here is to make the bomb, right? Everything else is secondary. And Congress is one of the few entities that could actually throw a wrench into that. Uh, they also had all sorts of problems as an aside with leaks and rumors and press articles. Um, they had, uh, uh, here's a New York Times article from 1941 where the president of the National Association of Science Writers charged that the government had clapped a censorship on laboratories developing an element which contained a 10 pound bomb would blast the hole 25 miles in diameter. Um, he basically said that anyone who's writing about uh, nuclear fission and atomic bombs is being uh, told they can't write on it. And this is of course being reported in the newspaper. They occasionally would have um, weird stories that came out, which would really ought not to have come out. So here is somebody, uh, uh, this is about a secret project and uh, in which a, a laundry worker has to you know, do all this work on the secret project in uh, Clinton, Tennessee, um, and that they are not allowed to talk about what they're doing because it's secret. And this is the kind of stuff they really worried about because if you were a, a German spy or you were a Soviet and you were looking at these stories, this would draw your attention that something was going on or if you were an auditor in Congress. Um, and they range from the very vague to there is a secret to the very specific. There is a big project in Tennessee. There is a big project in Northwest Washington state. Um, uh, here's one where a member of a draft board uh, basically gave information about a project they were doing. And he doesn't actually know they're making an atomic bomb, but this is sort of clearly he was told something. Uh, here they are announcing that there's a new uh, engineer, Clinton Engineering Works and a secret war production of a weapon that might be the one to end this war and telling you sort of how big it is, a major secret war effort. This is the kind of stuff that they thought that drove the security people crazy. Um, University officials would occasionally do this. So the president of UC Berkeley gave a speech in which he said that they were, you know, fighting to end the war and they were involved in this big secret project. And they don't necessarily even know what they're talking about. Sproul didn't know there was an atomic bomb project. He just knew there was a big project. It was very important and Berkeley was involved with it. Um, this is just a constant stream of difficulties they had in trying to tamp all these sort of rumors down. And it makes sense. You can't keep uh, 600,000 people a secret or even 60,000 people a secret. Uh, my favorite leak and maybe the worst of them, in uh, March 1944 uh, in Cleveland, a, a, a reporter uh, went to uh, New Mexico for vacation and he stumbled across Los Alamos and he stumbled across rumors and he tried to drive in there and he got told he had to turn around and he describes in great detail in this article that there's a laboratory out there and they're working on secret stuff. And he heard that this guy, Robert Oppenheimer is running the laboratory and he doesn't know what they're doing but it might involve atom smashing. That's what he heard. It might involve other things too. Um, that there's explosives in, in some way. And if you try to ask, you'll get, you'll get harassed by the police and the army will come get you. And he published this in the Cleveland Press. And um, of course, they found out very quickly, this copy is from the Manhattan Project files. Um, and this was, of course, your worst nightmare. They're literally describing Los Alamos really fairly accurately on the whole. They know who's running it. Um, and what can they do? Well, the voluntary censorship regime would basically allow them to stop syndication of certain stories, but it couldn't stop them coming out of nowhere if they uh, if it, they had just been published without being asked first. And so they stopped it from being syndicated. So it's total exposure with just whoever had the Cleveland Press that day. They also, Groves looked into the possibility of getting this reporter drafted into the army and sent to the front, um, but it turned out he was in his 60s. So that wasn't a possibility. 
I've used uh, ProQuest historical newspapers to try and see how many leaks there were, or at least how many mentionings of topics they considered sensitive. So they, at one point, put a voluntary censorship order in place on any articles about uranium, atom smashing, things like that. Um, and these are database searches. And you can see that there's a, t a lot of activity on this in the 1930s and 40s. And then it sort of dies out after 1941. That dotted line that I put there, that's when the censorship order goes in place. And you can see it doesn't really change anything. Um, there was a big drop off, but not after the censorship order. The big drop off is taking all those people who work on this topic and putting them into a secret laboratory so that they cannot do talk to the press anymore. Um, and uh, not, not any sort of more heavy handed approach. A couple little things. Uh, even when you make something secret, you can give stuff away. Um, there's a famous case in which a Russian scientist Georgi Flaroff realized that there was a Manhattan project going, there was some kind of bomb project going on by the very fact that nobody was publishing on it. And as a result, wrote to Stalin and explained that the, the lack of publishing on the subject of fission was not the result of an absence of research. It is because secrecy has been put in place and that is the best proof of the vigorous work going on ahead. Um, my other favorite example, and this is only in my book, I don't think it's ever been done anywhere else. Six, uh, six excuse me, seven Indian scientists came to the United States, um, and some of these are fairly important people, uh, uh, just as a sort of cultural exchange program with an ally during World War II, and they immediately started asking where the uh, uranium was being enriched. And this, of course, made the security people lose their minds and immediately put them into little cells and ask them where they learned that. And they said, we're not idiots. Uh, uh, and uh, they said to him, they said to the security people, with regard to subject uranium, it was their opinion that anyone with the slightest technical knowledge could plainly see that research in this field was going on. And therefore, the treatment by the United States Army of the subject as a highly classified one appeared to be a very foolish thing. And the security people were not very satisfied with that answer, but they did extract a promise by these uh, scientists not to talk about this anymore. But this is an example of if you're looking for it, you can see it, even if there's, whether you see the thing itself or whether you see the absence of discussion of it. Um, I believe this is the last one of Groves's reasons. Uh, to keep from having a great political discussion is to have uh, such a weapon, how such a weapon could or should be used. This would have stopped all progress and block the success of it. Um, this is similar to other concerns mentioned, but notice it's about streamlining policy. It's about making sure that the outcome is exactly what Groves wants. It's keeping the number of people in on these discussions small. Um, not totally successful. Um, this, Leo Zalar did agitate. He, he had a petition to uh, not drop the bomb. It was never given to the president. Um, it did result in Oppenheimer and others writing a recommendation on the immediate use of the weapon. That's about all that came out of uh, the, the, the attempted pushbacks on this. Um, uh, but uh, uh, so th but there wasn't that much of a policy discussion, though there was a little bit. Oh, no, this is the last one. The last one is to achieve all military surprise when the bomb is used and thus gain uh, the psychological effect, uh, which is really about Japan. Um, I just want to also point out that the psychological effect was not just surprise, it was also a degree of uh, proper understanding, as they might have put it. Um, they wanted the world to understand what the atomic bomb was. That includes Japan, that includes the Soviet Union, that includes the United Nations, the newly created. Um, so it's not just about ending the war. They saw the atomic bomb as sort of heralding a new future, and it needed a lot of attention. And so the secrecy was part of that, drawing that stark contrast uh, between the bomb and other things. Uh, much more could be said on this. Uh, it's in my book. So this involved uh, also planning to uh, write, to release information, how exactly to orchestrate the revelation of the bomb. So they, they drafted a uh, statement from the President of the United States. They drafted uh, news articles from the New York Times. Initially, this guy, William Lawrence, was meant to write the statement up for the president, but he wrote in such a flowery, flowery way that they had to get uh, the vice president of AT&T to write it instead, who was a little bit more sober. Lawrence ended up writing a lot of the initial press stories that were circulated uh, globally for the Manhattan Project. They were actually written internal to the project and then put out so that news journalists would have something to base their stories on without having to pry around too much. All right, so if we went over Groves' criteria for success, how did they do? Uh, keeping the Germans and Japanese ignorant, they were successful. Keeping the Soviets ignorant, not successful, total fail. Um, keeping everyone else uh, ignorant, mostly successful. I'll give them that one. They, they, they kept a lot of that 
uh, in, even if some scientists had inklings of these things. Uh, keep the scientists busy and focused and sticking to their knitting, mostly successful. Uh, most of them did exactly that. Uh, keep Congress ignorant, mostly successful. They did let in a few congressmen uh, sort of towards the end of the project, let in I think seven or something like that, uh, just to help smooth the rails on these appropriations things. Uh, but uh, it's seven out of how many congressmen there are. So that's, that's not that many. Um, avoid a larger political discussion about what to do with the bombs. Totally successful. Uh, the, the discussion never gets out of a very small number of people and there in fact really isn't much of a discussion at all. So that's part of the goal of the secrecy uh, for better and worse. Um, did they achieve their psychological effect by scaring the world by destroying two cities? Yes, they did, I think. They think they did a pretty good job of that. Um, uh, we could look at this and uh, uh, ask, you know, how much of this is because of what they did and how much of this is sort of getting lucky? Were the Germans and Japanese totally ignorant because of their secrecy was so great or because the Germans and Japanese were really bad at foreign intelligence? Um, probably a bit of both, um, uh, but it was a big project, had a lot of leaks, had a lot of rumors. Uh, if the Germans and Japanese had been looking for that and had thought that the United States might be doing it, I think they probably would have figured it out. And it's kind of interesting. The Soviets were in a very different position than that and you know, saw it pretty plainly. Um, this is Groves' sort of justification of the project secrecy after the spies had been discovered in 1950 about why they had totally failed to root out these spies. Um, and this is a secret testimony he gave before Congress. And I just think it's actually an interesting quote. Of course, the real point of security is that you can put all the, uh, up all the barbed wire fences you want to, and you can put up all the guards and you can have the censorship of men on the telephone as we did at Los Alamos, known to the people. Uh, but the censorship was primarily to guard against indiscretions. You don't catch disloyalty on censorship, you get indiscretions. Which is to say the Manhattan Project secrecy is not about catching moles. It is not really about catching spies. It is about making sure that this discussion and this work doesn't sort of bleed out into a larger context, which includes the media, uh, the rest of the world, Congress, things like that. Um, they were looking at rumors and leaks and uh, as Groves put it, indiscretions. They investigated over 1,500 of these rumors and loose talk uh, during the war, which is to say about two a day for the entire Manhattan Project. Um, the resources they spent on the spies were consider considerably fewer. So what do you make of all this? Uh, Manhattan Project secrecy regime was optimized towards a few specific ends. Uh, preventing large scale public disclosures through leaks, rumors, and speculation, not focused on insider threats, not focused on, on moles. They basically thought that if you were on the inside, you were pretty good unless you spoke too loudly about politics like Leo Zillard, and then maybe you were a problem. Um, Controlling personnel, um, both uh, to for the aim of sort of preventing leaks, but also to keep them focused and keep them from getting political. This is a deliberate part of the secrecy. Um, Congress is a bigger threat than the Nazis or the Soviets in many ways to them, uh, because again, only Congress can kill the project. Um, and uh, I think if you were giving it sort of a report card, you'd say their, their secrecy re regime worked towards these ends remarkably well, considering how essentially impossible the mandate is. I mean, considering keeping something this large totally secret, they didn't keep it totally secret, but they did a reasonably good job uh, for the sort of two and a half years it existed, though even they knew that it was just barely keeping it together. They really did not think they could keep this secret indefinitely. Um, what does remarkably well mean here? Uh, we're talking about by their standards. Um, and so that includes things that we might in retrospect ask questions about. Uh, again, the secrecy constrained debates on policy. Was that wise? Was that a good thing? I don't know, but that's what they wanted to do and that's what happened. Um, it constrained discussions of the health effects of both the Trinity test and the uh, atomic bombs over Japan. Uh, it constrained our understanding of the history of the Manhattan Project and sort of what it did and, and, and how it worked out. It took a lot of uh, later work to sort of reconstruct quite a lot of that. Um, it made in some ways the Manhattan Project fundamentally undemocratic. Uh, by the Manhattan Project criteria, these are positive things because democracy kills your projects. Um, uh, but we can, with the retro, you know, with the vantage point of history, ask whether or not that's an appropriate thing for the government to do and things of that nature. Anyway, that's all I want to talk about. I've talked for longer than I want. I have time for questions, uh, and I hope you've enjoyed this. There's so much more we could talk about, uh, but thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Alex. 
do it. Does anyone have questions? There were, there were, I, I know Alex couldn't see it, but there were a lot of comments um, all throughout that. Um, interesting comments and stories and um, from a lot of, a lot of people. So I know he didn't get to see all of those, but they were really fun to read. But if anyone has a specific question or something that they'd like to share, if you type it down there in the chat. Oh, I want to answer the first most important question, which is, can you pre-order the book? Yeah, how, how can we pre-order the book? It's on Amazon. You can pre-order it. There's no cover on Amazon yet. We just literally finalized it today, but you can pre-order. Thanks for asking, Ray. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Alex. I, it, was, it was a really fun talk. I enjoyed it. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Okay, it says question, maybe a bit off topic, but you mentioned that the Manhattan Project was a setup to build the bomb, not to see if it was possible. Do you know if they already decided to use the weapon at the start of the project? That is a really great question, Gert. Um, it's clear that they had some ideas towards this at the start. Um, they did have some early discussions about how you might use this. Then they're definitely trying to create a weapon to be used. But uh, so I think that it's fair to say their assumption was they expected to use it in some form, um, or at least the military did. Whether every scientist did is a different question, whether they thought it was just to deter against Germany or something like this. Um, but it's clear that Groves was thinking about this fairly early on. He had a discussion with Vannevar Bush in 43 um, in which they discussed the possibilities about using against Japan and actually said that they thought Japan would be a better target than Germany for several reasons. Um, I, this is very loose though. Uh, they don't really finalize discussions about what they're planning to do with the bomb until about late 1944 and really truly finalize it by early 1945. It's interesting to me that that kind of level of policy isn't really talked about that much until they basically have the bomb in hand, probably because they're not really sure what they have yet until that period. So one of the aside things is that Roosevelt has almost nothing to do with planning on how to use the bomb, almost nothing. It's all after he dies that that sort of starts, but it's presented to Truman as if, of course, they've all agreed on this all along, even though from what I can tell, they didn't really have any discussions about that. Okay, this is a question, maybe even kind of a comment. Did the Manhattan Project secrecy rules affect how secrecy occurred in industry and in other domains in the US in post-war years? Some of the rules match how some tech companies like Apple have behaved. That's an interesting. That's a really good question and I don't know the answer. Um, yeah. It would be a really interesting line of research to see whether they, some of those industrial companies, of course, had to use lots of secrecy during the war, all these contractors. There's actually a great book. Uh, the Chrysler Company did a lot of work for the Manhattan Project and actually put out a book about all their secrecy called Secret, which I just love that that's the simple title of the book. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether that had an influence on how these companies ran things later. I wouldn't be totally surprised because everywhere we see this kind of wartime research take place, we see continuities into the post-war, some of them more positive than secrecy, some of them things like how you have your physicists and your engineers work with each other in a slightly different mode than they might have before. Um, but I don't really know. It's a really good question. And um, it, I, I would not be surprised if at some point in the future, that was something that, that historians of science and technology investigated, because that's, that's, a, that's a spot on good history of science question. Yeah, there are a lot of questions here. I don't know if we're going to be able to get to them all. <laughs> But let's see, um, how exactly did they keep the Truman Commission at bay? Mostly by threatening Truman over the phone. I mean, it, I love the, the, there's a simplicity to most of their ways of dealing with congressmen, which is have somebody very important call up and repeat over and over again, you've got to drop this. <laughs> and sometimes, depending on how important it was, you get literally Roosevelt to call them up. And that was not just even the Truman Commission. They had labor problems and they got Roosevelt to call up the head of the AFI or AFL and sort of say, you've got to, you've got to quash this now. And they would do it if Roosevelt asked them to do it. So um, they, 
I think the Congress thing to me is really interesting because they don't have that much power over congressmen. You cannot just take a congressman and throw them in jail. You cannot threaten them the way you can threaten the press or, or an editor or even a scientist, right? You, they have considerable leverage. And so they did have to deal with them. Um, but Stimson dealt with Truman several times. And it's actually one of the more amusing things. Stimson kept a diary. And so we know Stimson's opinion of Truman before Truman was vice president or president. And it's not very favorable. And at one point, he described Truman as, as, a, as, a, as basically a mean person. And basically said he talks smooth, but thinks mean or something along those lines. And then of course, he had to work with Truman afterwards. So. So there are two questions that are kind of um, related to health and health impacts and safety. So what extent did the general secrecy around the Manhattan Project lead to a lack of safety protocols for soldiers who served in radioactive areas in Japan? And kind of related is the secrecy involving the Trinity test and the health impacts there. It's a tricky thing. It's sort of two things going on at once. One is that there is a lot of secrecy and they're limiting who can sort of work on these topics and talk about them and what they can know about them. Um, the second part is that some of the people at the head of the project, like Groves, really didn't think that radiation was that big of a deal in these cases. Um, and that was sometimes contrary to the opinions of the people who were doing like the health physics research for the Manhattan Project, who were sometimes quite frustrated by this. But in general, um, they kept very optimistic approaches to what the contamination might be and the effects. The best thing you can say in their defense is that they weren't. there was a lot of uncertainty. They didn't necessarily know that this was going to be a problem. The worst thing you can say is that they didn't assume that there might be a problem there and act out of an abundance of caution. And so with both the soldiers in areas of Japan, with the Japanese victims of the bombs themselves, they initially denied there were any radiation poisonings. They, didn't, they said it was all propaganda. That turns out not to be the case. Um, which they then had to walk that back a little bit later. Um, and also with um, uh, health safety, uh, the people downwind of the Trinity test, things like that. They did what we would today consider not, we would not consider what they did today due diligence in the all. I mean, their, their health precautions at Trinity were to station scientists at motels nearby with Geiger counters. And if the number went too high, you would try to evacuate the city. But to my knowledge, they didn't evacuate anything. Um, that's not that's not adequate <laughs> um, by modern standards. Whether they had health effects is controversial. Um, there, there's actually been a big study recently released uh, uh, just last year, I guess it was this year. This year has been a weird year um, uh, uh, of the surrounding communities. And the conclusion of the study as I read it is that it's not implausible that there were some health effects from the Trinity uh, fallout. However, it's very hard to establish that definitively because you're talking about uh, something where the records aren't great and it's a low level of radiation and there's a lot of uncertainty about low levels of exposure. Several people talk about how interesting General Groves was. Um, several people have mentioned that. And what it want to know what is your overall evaluation of Groves? I, I think, I mean, Stan Norris has a great biography of Groves um, racing for, is it racing for the bomb? I think it's racing for the bomb. And uh, I agree with Stan that Groves is the one character on the Manhattan Project that I think is literally indispensable. If you had somehow had Oppenheimer not be part of it, I think you probably could have gotten somebody of good caliber. Maybe it wouldn't have gone as smoothly. Maybe that some things wouldn't have worked as well. Maybe they wouldn't have met every schedule or every deadline, but it, it would have probably gotten there. Um, if you don't have Groves as the head of the project and you don't have somebody who is that doggedly determined to get the job done, it doesn't happen. And he, just by sort of mostly by making phone calls, which I find just mind boggling, um, managed to sort of keep this whole thing moving and together and fend off every attack and make sure that it had the highest priority so he could have as much manpower as he wanted, as much steel as he wanted and fight off everybody who would oppose him and make enemies throughout the entire army as a result because the other generals didn't know who this guy was. Uh, I don't think that you get a bomb without that kind of, I don't think you get a bomb in two and a half years without that kind of determination. Um, and we can ask whether that's a good thing or not. <laughs> you know, the Manhattan Project has an ambiguous legacy. And to do, accomplish that, he had to, you know, again, make sure that nobody was participating in many of these policy decisions who disagreed with him and make sure Congress wasn't part of it and make it essentially anti-democratic and things like that. And if, if you think the Manhattan Project was exactly 
the best way things could have been in history, then you give Groves a really passing grade. If instead you see it as a herald of things to come, then maybe that's a, you know, an, an ambiguous situation, but he's, he's important. He's very interesting. And if you're interested more in Groves, I strongly recommend Stan's book. <laughs> How important in the motivation for secrecy was the fear of failure and the principals spinning their careers testifying to Congress about the reasons. So this was certainly Groves' motivation for everything, in my view. Um, and I think the secrecy is sort of, for, for Groves, the entire point of the Manhattan Project is to successfully execute the Manhattan Project. Um, and he doesn't, Groves didn't even want the job when he was given it originally. And he basically said, well, I, I won't take this unless you basically make it possible for me to do this successfully. And then he determined that he was going to be successful. Um, and uh, that is his entire MO, is, is getting bombs ready to use in the war at any cost. And so the secrecy is part of that. I wouldn't say that was necessarily motivation for the secrecy, except as much as the secrecy accomplishes that for Groves. Um, can you talk about how the effects of the project secrecy have rippled down over the decades in perhaps unexpected and unhelpful ways? Attitudes toward handling radioactive and toxic waste. Um, I, uh, uh, I could, but it would take an entire book. Yeah, so right. I, I highly recommend you read my book because that's the basically the first third of the book is the man is, is building up to the use of the atomic bomb because that's when so many things get put into place and then the rest of the book is what comes next and how many of those things stay on how many of those things get modified what changes as you get into the cold war and the late cold war and the post cold war uh so if you're interested in this okay I here's a good, book for you to read here's a good question i like um do you feel secrecy has impeded your research into the early years of the bomb? Is there still a culture of overprotection and excessive secrecy, even for those early years, in your opinion? I mean, if you research secret topics, then secrecy is going to get in your way. That's just how it is. And you accept that. And you could get really bitter about that. And it feels really personal when they don't give you what you want to look at. But um, there's a lot out there, especially on the Manhattan Project. Yeah, there's still stuff that's classified but there is a lot released. So there's plenty to go off of. And there are things where of course one has questions that can't be answered, but rarely do I think that the answer is probably in something I can't see. <laughs> um, so I'm not saying that secrecy, obviously any story you're gonna tell about secrecy is gonna be incomplete, it has to be. Um, but, um, but we can tell a lot more than people realize. There's more there's more documents than I think one has time to ever look at in one's lifetime. And I will say the United States has a lot of secrecy and has a whole history of it and it has this huge secrecy regime, but it is in many ways more open than many other nuclear nations. Uh, it, we have the Freedom of Information Act. They do declassify things. You cannot write similar books about the French program. You cannot write similar books about the Chinese program. Uh, you can just now sort of write some of these things about the Soviet program because their, their entire country collapsed and a lot of those things got declassified. But um, uh, uh, so, I mean, one can, in the United States, we have a presumption of openness, which does help us a bit. And that doesn't mean that the amount of secrecy we have is the right amount or anything like this, but I am, uh, uh, you, you can do a lot more than most people realize. And I just want to, do two sh shout outs out here, two people who I can see their little faces. One is Avner Cohen, who has written a book on Israel and the bomb, and is another great example of how much Israel is a state that doesn't even admit it as nuclear weapons. And yet Avner's wrote, written two great books on this. Uh, and Stephen Schwartz, who has a great book, Atomic Audit, which is uh, basically trying to figure out how much nuclear weapons cost and how that is, you know, an effort strongly impeded by the secrecy as well. And yet he manages to come up with pretty good uh, uh, estimates. And I'll do one last question. How did Oppenheimer fit into the secrecy issue? Oppenheimer is really interesting and I don't need to tell any audience of this talk <laughs> if that's the case. But one of the things I find most interesting about Oppenheimer, um, by and large, he embraced whatever secrecy orders Groves put down. Um, he did not push back that much. And I think that was one of the reasons why Groves liked him. And also one of the reasons that their teamwork worked um, if Groves, the scientists really chafed when Groves 
gave secrecy orders. They saw this as being fundamentally anti-scientific. But if, if Oppenheimer did it, Oppenheimer is a scientist scientist. And so if he does it and he thinks it's a good idea, then that sort of smooths it over. And so Groves would actually make Oppenheimer issue things that Groves had himself written and Oppenheimer might edit them a little bit. But basically things that looked like they were coming from Oppenheimer were often from Groves. There are a few places where Oppenheimer did push back either because other scientists encouraged him to, which was occasionally the case, or uh, because he himself thought it was important. And the most important of these was the Los Alamos Colloquium series. So this was a technical colloquium that was open to all members who had uh, access to the technical area of the lab, meant to sort of share conversations and create something like that shared environment of scientific discourse. And it's the sort of anti-compartmentalization. And Groves really resisted this because it seemed like exactly the wrong thing. But Oppenheimer said that if you don't do this, we won't function coherently as a laboratory and people will be very unhappy. And, uh, and so he did. And we have a full list of all the talks that were given because they show up in Klaus Fuchs's file. So, I mean, and he went to all of them. So in a way, it, it, you know, it wasn't the most positive thing in retrospect, but there you go. Um, so a lot of people are saying, great talk. Um, they're looking forward to reading the book. And a couple of people have said, we hope you can come and visit um, so you can meet us in person soon. <laughs> I'd love to do it. And in the meantime, if you have a dying question, feel free to email me and I will try to write you back, but you know how it is right now with emails and working yeah. at home and all that kind of stuff. So I try. <laughs> much. I, really great stories come out of this topic. So it's always fun to think about, you know, those times. Um, I appreciate everyone tuning in and we appreciate your continued support and your donations, um, helping us through this while the museum has to be closed. So it's great seeing the people on the scroll there and all of the names. And we can't wait to see you in person again. But until then, thank you for joining us. And we hope you'll be back in the spring for some of our other talks. Everyone is saying, um, thank you again. Thanks for the talk, great presentation. Um, so that's thank awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. Thanks a bunch. I will read the chat at my leisure. Yeah, there are some more uh, questions there, that I did. There's some nice stories in there too. Um, yeah, and there's some great stories. I know my neighbor used to uh, be a secretary or she worked for the Manhattan Project. And I try and talk to her and ask her questions. And she just says, oh, I can't say, I can't say. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> 95. You're 95. You can say now. <laughs> no. The, the book will be available in ebook. I think I'm contractually... <laughs> obligated to say that so <laughs> okay awesome thank you everyone good night good night